So good afternoon, everyone. It's 12 noon. We'll get started. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, just a quick reminder before we get started, uh, I will ask you to please uh, enter your questions in the chat at the end of the presentation. And please answer a brief survey, also which will be sent to you at the end of the presentation. This will let us know that you were present today. So our medical grand rounds today are brought to us courtesy of the Division of Medical Oncology. And I will ask Dr. Nathaniel Buganim, Buganim who is the Chief of uh, the Division of Medical Oncology to introduce our speaker. Nathaniel, go ahead. Thank you, Nadia. So I'm quite pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Sarah Soldera. So for those of you who don't remember her or don't know her, she trained in medical oncology here at McGill. Um, uh, a bit over five years ago, did a thoracic and breast oncology fellowship at PMH um, and was quite successful and, and did really well that she landed a great job at uh, Charlotte Moine and uh, rapidly, even though she was a junior staff, became medical director of hematology and oncology clinical research in 2019. And then more recently, um, uh, has been, uh, you know, associate director for clinical research for the whole center of Shalom Wine in 2022. So we've had, we were lucky enough to just recruit her, um, and she'll be starting in the next week. Um, there's a lot of projects that we've done together with Miguel and Shalom Wine and Multicentric with PMH that involve her as the lead PI, um, uh, and she, and we're quite pleased to have her to join the uh, upper GI team with Dr. Ferry, as well as the breast team. So without further ado, I'll let uh, Dr. Soldera start her presentation. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for that, that, that introduction and Dr. Buganim. I'm really happy to be with you here today. Um, uh, given the context of medical grand rounds, I wanted to offer a talk on a practical approach to emerging biomarkers in clinical oncology. Uh, so this is, a, so here goes. Um, so the objectives of my presentation are really to review key definitions regarding biomarkers in oncology, define criteria for use and application of these, of these emerging biomarkers. How should we uh, define that a biomarker is a good biomarker? When should we actually use it to dictate our therapies? And also show you some practical applications. Where would you see this uh, coming from medical grand rounds in your respective specialties? I wanted to show how this is pertinent really uh, in day-to-day -day practice and what are the limitations associated with these and how you should take a critical view when looking at biomarkers, just as you would for new therapies. So first of all, personalized medicine, this is a term that everybody is using in oncology. It's a very kind of a catch uh, catchphrase right now. It's also referred to as targeted or precision medicine. And it really refers to tailoring of preventative diagnostic or therapeutic interventions to the characteristic of an individual or a population. Basically trying to find treatments that really target a better population uh, so that the patients have better outcomes in terms of survival, but also have specifically less toxicity in terms of the treatments, given that the treatment is more targeted and less broad um, treating like chemotherapy would. Um, this un the underlying um, this implies that a biomarker is needed because if you're going to tailor a specific if you're going to come up with specific treatments that only work in a certain category of patients, you really have to be able to define that uh, population properly. So inherent to the definition of personal medicine is the ability to classify into individuals into a subpopulation based either on their susceptibility to, to a disease, a response to a specific treatment. And so this notion of biomarker is really in, it, crucial to personalized medicine. So not just the therapies like we usually refer to in terms of personalized medicine. Um, so in terms of biomarkers, how do we define a biomarker? So a biomarker is defined as a measure, an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes, or biological responses uh, to, an expo to an exposure or an intervention, or th including therapeutic interventions. And in the context of medical oncology, we specifically look a lot at molecular or genomic biomarkers. And so there's been a lot of um, work done to try to define what a biomarker is and how it should be evaluated and properly defined. 
So different kinds of biomarkers, I, I've been touching on this uh, in the last few minutes, but basically uh, we can use biomarkers. They're very useful to identify patients who are more at risk of a specific disease, to diagnose a certain condition, to monitor a specific, the status of a disease. So for example, a test that's used to see if a patient has a cancer or is at risk of developing a cancer, but also uh, looking at it through time longitudinally. And in the context of oncology, we look mostly at prognostic and predictive biomarkers with more, and that will be more specific to this talk. And I'll get into more detail, the difference between prognostic and predictive, but essentially trying to classify patients who have worse or better outcomes and those who are more likely to respond to treatment and then follow our patients who are on treatment to see, are they responding as they should? So that's another use in terms of a response biomarker. And finally, safety biomarkers. Are patients developing toxicities um, to given treatment or to a uh, uh, given exposure? So just to define this before we start, because this will be crucial to our talk today, the difference between prognostic and predictive, a prognostic biomarker really entails more uh, the link between the result of a biomarker and a specific outcome. So if you give the example of HER2 positive breast cancer, HER2, this, whether a patient has a HER2 positive or negative breast cancer is a prognostic biomarker in the sense that if a patient has HER2 status that is positive, they have worse outcomes. Uh, patients with HER2 positive breast cancer at diagnosis, regardless of if we don't apply a given treatment, really have a worse prognosis and, for example, have less response to chemotherapy and and um, and traditional endocrine therapy. And so if you do nothing in the context of a HER2-positive breast cancer, it's associated with a worse prognosis in terms of survival long-term or recurrence. When you look at, however, if you look at predictive, a predictive biomarker is more associated with the risk of response to something. And, and so given a, a specific therapy to a treatment, if you have the presence of the biomarker, you're more likely to respond to this therapy. Whereas if you don't, if you don't get the specific, uh, if you don't have the biomarker, then that therapy is not really useful to you. In the context of HER2-positive breast cancer, yes, it's a negative prognostic marker, but is a it is, HER2 is also highly predictive of, res, of a response to HER2-based therapies like trastuzumab or pertuzumab. And long-term, these patients, in fact, have better outcomes in terms of survival when those therapies are applied. But in the absence of therapy, these patients would do worse. So in terms of um, common examples, just to show you that you guys are already well-versed in biomarkers and we use them very practically in oncology and in, in different spheres of medicine, uh, susceptibility biomarker, HPV. So patients who have certain uh, subtypes of HPV are, have, are at higher risk of developing uh, cervical cancer, monitoring biomarkers, PSA, for example, patients, men who, for example, are followed by their general practitioners can use PSA as potential as the presence of a, of a diagnosis of prostate cancer. Finally, prognostic markers, as I explained, HER2, for example, and predictive. Another good example is the estrogen receptor. So I think most people know well that patients who have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, it the presence of this biomarker is associated with a response to endocrine therapy. And therefore patients are given these treatments only in the presence of this biomarker. And finally, a good example of a safety biomarker would be the use of left ventricular ejection fraction in following patients who are under therapy, for example, with trastuzumab. So Herceptin, as most of you know well, uh, a drop in ejection fraction can is associated with cardiotoxicity related to these treatments. So another word that is used, I'm just using some key definitions to inform our talk later, is a companion diagnostic. So a companion diagnostic is really um, more of a, of a regulatory term in the sense that it's it was defined by the FDA um, in terms of um, a biomarker that is used more to properly define a treatment that should be used. So it's defined as a corresponding use of a corresponding therapeutic product to identify patients who are most likely to benefit and to be at increased risk for, or to be at increased risk of a serious adverse reaction. 
And practically speaking, when a drug is approved for an indication uh, and it has, and it's only used in a specific subgroup of patients, the companion diagnostic will often be will be defined not only in terms of the biomarker, but how the test should be done and which bio, which tests are approved along with the drug. So common examples here in Canada. So this is PCoder, which is basically the rest of Canada, INICE, uh, that have reviewed biomarkers associated with. Uh, with the uh, drugs. So vermurafenib, a BRAF inhibitor that's used in melanoma, in the treatment of melanoma. The, bi the companion diagnostic is B BRAF V600, crizotinib, a TKI that's used for ALK rearranged lung cancer. ALK is the approved di companion diagnostic. And this really entails that a drug is really only reimbursed and used in patients who have a positivity by a recognized companion diagnostic. Now, given that biomarkers are so important for the um, use of targeted of personalized medicine and therefore really important in defining these populations that are likely to benefit from potentially these life-saving drugs, uh, I hope I've convinced you that biomarkers really are important and should be evaluated as critically as drugs should be. Uh, and so there's been a lot of work to try to evaluate, to try to uh, evaluate how a biomarker should be used uh, and how it should be defined and how it should be assessed in, term in terms of its validity. And so there was a great paper by Dr. Hayes, who's a physician who is really uh, important in the development of many biomarkers in breast cancer. And I invite you to read this paper. It's really quite um, uh, interesting. It's called Defining Clinical Utility of a Tumor Biomarker Test, a Clinician's Viewpoint. So he really summarizes uh, ways in which patient, um, all invo involved stakeholders should be assessing the validities of biomarkers and should we use that biomarker, yes or no. And he breaks it down into a great framework, which I find is very practical and leads to, it's very thought provoking. So first of all, I think everyone would recognize we have to first assess the analytical validity of a biomarker, which is basically, is the, is, does the test, uh, does it have the ability uh, to detect and measure with statistical significance, the presence of a biomarker of interest accurately, reproducibly, and reliably. So this includes uh, really important measures such as um, sensitivity and the specificity of a test, but also uh, informs on how the test should be done. So for example, certain lab techniques that should be used, how the tissue should be processed to really reproduce uh, the results that were shown in the initial studies that put it into place. Uh, so that's, I think that's quite what we usually think of when we think of, um, is a test a valid? Uh, in terms of, if you take that a step further, you should then assess the clinical validity of the biomarker. Clinical validity refers more of the of a contextual, uh, the validity of the test in a contextual sense. So the ability of an assay to divide with statistical significance, one population into two or more groups on the basis of outcomes. So looking, is the test able to properly separate a population into two specific groups? And will there be, do those two groups have different outcomes depending on what the, the biomarker is supposed to identify? And then finally, what I think is more uh, difficult to define and uh, what Dr. Hayes shows very well has been, has been more controversial is looking at the clinical utility the clinical utility takes it a step further and really looks more at the ability to really improve in the diagnosis, the treatment, the management, the prevention of cancer with the use of the assay. So, and this is very, um, this, the t this takes it a step further and has more of a, um, more of a bias in the sense of who is interpreting the utility of this test. And I'll show that to you a little bit later in the next slide. I also wanted to uh, show the context. So first of all, he talks of this concept of an opt-in or an opt-out situation related to the context of the use of a biomarker. An opt-in biomarker test would be, for example, if you were to have a biomarker test and the result would be positive, then you would add on additional interventions. Whereas an opt-out context would be that you would exclude patients from having certain treatments. And I think this really contextualizes the importance of what we deem to be a, a um, clinically valid and useful uh, um outcome. And so, for example, if an opt-in situation would be BRCA testing, if a patient has breast cancer, uh, 
you treat, you diagnose that breast cancer, and in certain circumstances, you would do germline BRCA1 and 2 testing. Now, if the test is positive, you would then add on additional treatments such as prophylactic bilateral mastectomy or oophorectomy. Whereas, and if you if the test is negative, you would go on with standard therapy as recommended. Whereas opt-out example would be more, for example, patient with endocrine therapy. If the patient has an ER positive tumor, you, you would give a standard endocrine therapy, whereas if it's ER negative, then you would remove a specific treatment. And this really speaks to what are we willing to accept in terms of the negative, positive, and predictive value. For, for example, in the context of an opt-in biomarker test, if you're BRCA positive, you probably would be unwilling to name patients BRCA positive if in fact they're negative. You wouldn't want to submit a patient to a prophylactic surgeries that they don't need and further management in terms of their, their risk of, of subsequent cancers. Whereas in the context of opt-out, if you have an ER positive cancer, you'd probably be willing to overcall ER positivity, given that the therapy applied is well tolerated, and you certainly wouldn't want to remove a specific uh, a treatment that would be efficacious and very well tolerated. And so the context in which you're willing to tolerate mistakes in either direction, I think are very important when you evaluate a biomarker. Now, in terms of clinical utility, he really identifies, he proposes a framework by which to define this. So looking at analytical validity, as we looked at the specific endpoint. So the endpoints of greatest benefit would obviously be survival benefits in terms of oncology uh, biomarkers and toxicities being maybe of less importance in terms of the, uh, the usefulness of a biomarker. He also brings up this concept of a minimal clinical difference that we'd be willing to accept. So in an example where you'd be willing to accept that you find, for example, a survival of 5% to be a great, um, to be a great uh, difference, that would be considered a large, a large benefit. Whereas if you were to think of 5% difference in toxicity, you would think, well, that's not really much of a difference. So it's all contextual. And finally, the level of evidence, you have level one evidence from randomized trials where you really look prospectively at these biomarkers, or are you really taking them more from retrospective series where there's a lot much, a lot more risk of ascertainment bias, for example. And finally, this concept of clinical utility, it's always also looking at who's the stakeholder evaluating uh, these biomarkers. If you think of it as a, as from a, a a guideline panelist, they might be more willing uh, to accept uh, the utility of a test, really looking at endpoints like survival and really not wanting to potentially exclude patients from potentially life-saving treatments, whereas, and patients would probably feel the same way. Whereas if you look at a third-party payer or from a societal point of view, you might think of it more from a, a financial perspective, having to really balance the risk of false positive, false negative rates in terms of a financial perspective. So again, bringing in this layer of uh, context, uh, contextual uh, evaluation of the biomarker. So let's get a bit more practical, let's get away, but I think those frameworks and definitions are important to these next slides, but I wanted to show you how this is important really in our clinical practice every day, even to people outside of oncology. So I wanted to give some uh, specific examples. So I think in the last maybe five, 10 years, you would have seen a patient and in, in reviewing their chart, you would see a 75 year old female that has metastatic breast cancer. She's ERPR, her disease is ERPR negative and HER2 negative. So what would be called triple negative breast cancer? And most people would say, well, it ends there. I wanted to show you that now by today's definitions, this would be, uh, I would say, well, tell me more about her disease. And I would ask about the PDL1 status and the BRCA status. And this would really inform the treatments that I would recommend to this patient. And another example, so patient Y, 52 year old female with metastatic breast cancer again, her disease is ERPR positive. So hormone receptor positive disease and HER2 negative. In the past, we would have stopped there, but this is no longer appropriate of a definition for these patients. I would wanna know about her PIK3CA status, 
Some might argue ESR, ESR1 status and BRCA status to inform lines of therapy and prognosis. So I wanted to show you, you'll see these definitions. I, I was speaking to a friend who works in cardiology and she says, you guys always have all these acronyms. And you know, these acronyms are actually very important to the selection of therapy and the follow-up of patients. And I think it's important that uh, on a broader scale, uh, other specialties become more familiar with them. So that's the goal of the next part of this presentation and also show you the limitations of these biomarkers, that it's not so black and white as maybe saying ERPR and HER2 as we have used in the past, which have had, which are tests that have been defined over decades. So I wanted to use the example of metastatic breast cancer uh, because there was a, an interesting uh, paper that was published. It was a guideline update from ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, that looked at which biomarkers should be done in metastatic breast cancer patients. And they gave level of recommendations in terms of um, their consensus, the quality of the evidence, and the strength of the recommendation to finally classify those that should be done and those that should not be done. So those that should be done are PIK3CA, BRCA, PDL1. Um, MMR or MSI status, TMB and NTREC, whereas those that shouldn't are in the white portion of the table that I have here. And I'll have to, for the interest of time, I think we'll have to reserve that for part two of the of the, of the lecture, possibly. But uh, I really think actually the ones that they decided not to include are just as interesting. So the first test I wanted to show, and I'll really illustrate, I'll define what these are so you get a better sense of what these biomarkers are, but also try to highlight some of key issues in biomarker testing at large through uh, these examples. So the first, uh, the first biomarker is PIK3CA. So PIK3CA is a mute is a gene that is mutated in many cancers, uh, but it's 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 become become more widely talked about in breast oh, excuse me in breast cancer uh, because uh, there's a therapy that's associated with it that's now considered standard treatment, a second line in hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer. And it's found, in fact, it's quite common in 40% of these patients, it's positive. And the SOLAR1 clinical trial showed by, def by defining these patients as positive through a PCR test, looking at 11 mutations through either ctDNA, so a liquid biopsy, or in a tissue sample. And if the, the patients had, their cancers had the presence of this mutation, they benefited, if you look here on the graph on the right, the, quote, the graphs on top are progression-free survival in patients that are PIK3CA mutant. So those who have a tumor that has this mutation, the blue is with the treatment with alpelisib, and the red is with the sta a standard second-line endocrine treatment. And we see a separation of the curves showing that the addition of this targeted therapy, alpelisib, really seems to benefit in these patients with uh, the mutation, whereas those in the lower graph who don't have the presence of this mutation in their cancer really don't benefit from the addition of alpelisib. So I wanted, so it seems pretty straightforward, pick 3 ca positive. So if you have it, give the treatment. If you don't, don't give the treatment, but it's not as simple as that. And so I really wanted to highlight some key issues, which in fact are issues in a lot of biomarkers. So for example, the sample tested, I think this really pick 3 ca was a great example of how the the a difference in sample can really change the positivity of a test and also the outcomes of patients. So first of all, if you look at tissue versus ctDNA, the, the rate of positivity is does not have 100% concordance as you would expect. And also how you do the ctDNA does not influences the rate of concordance. So in the table on the right here, you see the concordance of the, the sensitivity of the test ranges from 67 to 88% when compared to um, the what they define as the gold standard in this case, the tissue status from 67 to 88%. That's actually quite broad. If I told you that the sensitivity of a test was 67%, you think it was quite poor, whereas 88%, it's starting to get pretty good. And so what was the difference in how the ctDNA was done? So the sensitivity of 67% was when you did a CT a tissue a, a CT DNA it with less uh, DNA input. So you're looking at less, essentially, uh, less frag, a smaller amount of DNA. So if you use 16 nanograms of DNA input, your sensitivity was 67%. Whereas if you increase the uh, DNA input to 227 nanograms, it increases to 74%. And so the concordance between blood and tissue 
really differs depending on how what, how you test how you test the ctDNA sample. Secondly, the timing of the testing also influenced the positivity of the test. So if you take a patient, so pic 3 ca is more likely to occur in patients who are progressing. So if you have a patient who has progressive cancer, they're on their first line therapy, and you know, you see on a CT scan that their disease is getting worse, there's new areas of cancer, they're symptomatic, et cetera, you then see that you're more likely to find a pic 3 ca mutation than if you were to do it on an archival sample. So for example, if you, do, you took a biopsy sample from when the, the breast was biopsied initially at her diagnosis before she had metastases, the likelihood of having a pic 3 ca mutation is lower than if you biopsy a tissue, for example, a liver metastasis or a, a lung metastasis of a progressive site. And so the timing of the biopsy is also important. So the sample that you choose in terms of the relation to progression of cancer also changes the rate of positivity. Also, if you look at the same thing goes for ctDNA. So in this last level, when I said the sensitivity could go up to 88% is when they excluded patients who were not progressing, they found that um, they could they could increase their yield. So if you their positive rate. So basically, if you took a blood test at the time of progression, the ctDNA was more likely to be positive. So basically, with pic 3 ca I think it illustrates the point that the timing of when you use a sample, so at disease progression or not at time of diagnosis initially, and also what kind of sample and how you you, pr you process that sample really has a, a difference in defining a PIK3CA positive tumor. And finally, this sounds like, okay, PIK3CA positive, you could just repeat it or not repeat it. Uh, does it really make a difference? Well, in fact, in the, the graphs on top, you see on the left, if you look at overall survival in patients that are overall PIK3CA mutant, the benefit, the hazard ratio is of 0.86, so a hazard ratio that favors the exper experimental arm, but not that not that significantly. Whereas if you look at patients who have who have pic 3 ca uh, found by ctDNA, their survival is even it, the hazard ratio. The intervention with adding alpelisim seems much better with a hazard ratio of 0.74. It's thought that patients who have a lot of pic 3 ca who have a lot of shedding tumors, so basically tumors that are very active and have this mutation that's very present in peripheral blood might benefit more from the therapy. And so not only do you influence the rate of positivity and therefore either give a patient a treatment or not, but you might also, the positivity in the blood can also inform uh, the performance of the, the, the drug itself. BRCA1 and 2, I won't go into as much detail about the testing because I think that's been a test that's been more um, validated in the past in the context of a risk of breast cancer, but I wanted to show the, the fact that the context is important. So for example, in the past, we used to say, well, patients who have certain criteria would, would be recommended to have germline BRCA1 and 2 testing. For example, a patient of very young age, younger than 50 years old, should have germline BRCA testing, whereas patients who, or those with a strong family history or the presence of other tumors should be sent for germline BRCA1 and 2 testing. The reason why, because at the time we use, we use germline BRCA more as a risk for future cancers or other cancers or risk for the family. Whereas now, germline BRCA testing is a predictive biomarker. There are drugs that only work if you have the presence of a germline BRCA1 and 2. So alaparib and telazoparib, which are PARP inhibitors, are now a therapeutic indication in patients who have these mutations. And so it's now recommended as per guidelines that all patients with metastatic breast cancer should have this testing. And so not only does the context of timing and so on inf should inform the testing, but also the clinical context. Now that it's a predictive biomarker and not only just prognostic for future, it should be done in all patients and not just done in those uh, who have specific uh, high risk categories. A good example, another good example of the recommended test, I mentioned that metastatic patients, they recommended NTREC fusion testing. NTREC fusion, so um, I think they've had a lot of buzz because it was kind of a, it was a very, um, a, a new, uh, it was a cancer agnostic, a site specific, um, a tumor agnostic um, test and, uh, and therapy. So basically, any tumor can have an NTREC fusion and respond to specific targeted therapies, which I'll show later. But 
um, these these fusions, however, this the this Entrec fusions are actually very rare. So if you look at the graph at the bottom, this represents common cancer. So for example, if you look at breast cancer, it's around here. Less than one percent of breast cancers have these tumors. Whereas if you look in other contexts, so in pediatric tumors, greater than 75% of infantile, uh, infantile fibrosarcomas or forms of secretory breast cancers will have an entric fusion. In adults, so more in my world, I don't treat pe pediatric cancers, it's really rare forms of secretory uh, breast cancers that have this up to 90% of these tumors will have these fusions or secretory carcinoma of the salivary gland. And so again, depending on the context, it informs should you be really looking for these fusions or should you really say, oh, it's really once I've exhausted all therapies that it might be worthwhile looking for these. So I really wanted to highlight that the context again is important. In my common, in, I think most people don't do NTREC fusions um, for in metastatic breast cancer, despite the recommendation by ASCO, because they're so rare and we have other therapies. But it could be argued that in certain forms of breast cancers, like secretory breast cancer, then they should we should really look for these fusions. So the context really informs. Um, and it's not, as I mentioned, so the reason it's so important to identify these fusions is that there's very effective therapies. So entrectinib and larotrectinib are basically um, targeted therapies that work really just in the presence of this uh, of this biomarker. And this is site specific, site, uh, site agnostic. So it can work in, in other forms of cancer, for example, cholangiocarcinoma that we don't have great therapies, head and neck tumors, and really uh, all forms of cancer, there seem to be responses if there's the presence of this biomarker. So uh, another point that I thought was interesting with NTRAC is the testing that you choose to do really depends on your uh, pretest probability. So I just want to highlight some of the algorithms that are proposed on the left is ESMO, on the right is uh, by um, a test. Uh, a algorithm that was proposed by Garrido and all, and I'll just use this example. So for example, in a sample that you know tumors with high frequency of NTREC fusions, for example, secretory breast cancers, as I said, you really expect the, the sample to be positive. If I say 90% of tumors have this characteristic, you're not really gonna believe, you, you'll be more critical of a negative result, right? And so uh, it's recommended that you do, uh, for example, FISH or IHC, so looking for the protein expression, if it's positive, you confirm with an NGS, but if it's negative, you should still consider an NGS panel uh, because you might be missing tumors given the pretest probability is so high. Whereas in tumors of low frequency, for example, a common non-secretory breast cancer or other forms of tum tumors, colon, lung, whatever, you might accept your, your negative result far more, um, far more readily and therefore not go with a confirmation test. So again, the pretest probability, the context in which you're doing the test is very important. Now the next, oh, I seem to have somehow drawn on my presentation. Sorry about that, but I'll just let it be. I don't think it, I think you guys can still see very well. The next series of biomarkers are really related more to the use of immunotherapy, and these are uh, even more complex and controversial. And I think it's important to highlight uh, why these uh, biomarkers are not as simple as saying, you know, ER positive tumor, HER2 positive tumor. You know, if you say a tumor is HER2 positive, whether it be breast cancer or gastric cancer, the test is somewhat similar and means the same thing. Whereas uh, biomarkers related to immune checkpoint inhibitors are a lot more complex, and I wanted to give you an overview of this and introduce the concept of these biomarkers to you as well. That way, when you're reviewing uh, oncology patients, you understand the context and really appreciate some of the limitations of our tests. So I think many of you have heard a lot of presentations about immune checkpoint inhibitors in the last year, so I won't talk your ear off about that, but just as a brief summary for those who haven't, um, checkpoint inhibitors are basically drugs that we use, a family of drugs that we use and have really changed uh, the management of a lot of uh, tumor sites. Um, what they, what the, one of the hallmarks of cancer is that tumor cells are and are able to uh, basically evade immune response. And so despite having a cell in you that really, from an antigen perspective, looks very different from the rest of you, your immune system is not activated to uh, really attack or get rid of that cell. And so there's no immune activation um, stimulated from uh, this cancer. And so if you look on the graph on the left, it represents a cancer cell in blue and a T cell in, in green. And what you see, the reason for this um, 
uh, this uh, immune inactivation is basically that you have a talk between the cancer cells and the T cells, and there's between the MHC and the T cell receptors, there should be an activating uh, an activating response when um, antigens are presented. However, there's co-receptors that downregulate this activation, one of which being PDL1, which is a marker on a tumor. Uh, uh, on a tumor cell and PD-1, which is more on T cells. Uh, it's a, a very oversimplified. Overall, when PD-1 interacts with PD-L1, what happens is there's a negative ex a negative signaling pathway that's that's um, that's sent that says basically the immune cells, you know, don't attack this cancer cell. I'm part of self. And so the treatments, immune checkpoint inhibitors, what they are, are antibodies that basically block this interaction, either by occupying PD-1 or PD-L1, and, and stopping this negative, uh, this downregulation of the immune system. And so what immune, what immune checkpoint inhibitors broadly do is that you're harnessing the power of the immune system to really attack cancer cells. And which is why in a lot of cancer sites, this has really been a great treatment. And particularly in those that tend to have a high immune response. So if you think of melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, head and neck tumor, so tumors that are traditionally associated with uh, carcinogens that have a lot of antigen presentation because there's a lot of um, mutations associated with these cancers, they tend to have a higher rate of response to, P to immune checkpoint inhibitors. Other tumors, unfortunately, like breast cancer, really didn't respond well to immunotherapy in the past. And there's been a lot of studies done uh, that were quite disappointing. And so a lot of effort has been put into trying to find biomarkers that could really identify, well, which subset of breast cancer patients or other cold tumors, so cold tumors being tumors that don't stimulate the immune system, could really benefit from these revolutionary drugs. And so there's been a lot of work to find biomarkers for uh, the predictive biomarkers for the use of immunotherapy. The other evidence that we see that there's clearly biomarkers that need to be uh, found is the fact that even in tumors that are thought to not respond to immunotherapy, we all have anecdotal response in patients who have these long-term responses, even though long-term, the it's a very rare subgroup of patients. There's clearly some people who respond, even though their tumor site, for example, hormone receptor positive breast cancer, uh, traditionally shouldn't respond to immunotherapy, but some some patients do and so clearly we're not properly defining which one are those which are these patients who would benefit and so in breast cancer there's been um in triple negative breast cancer this is a tumor that's more aggressive more immune stimuli stimulating and that we've seen uh, certain subtypes of triple negative breast cancer really show evidence of immune stimulation in the sense of a lot of lymphocytes infiltrating the tumors and so there was more interest for checkpoint inhibitors in this class of uh, breast cancer and in fact, it's now standard therapy to combine pembrolizumab, which is a PD-1 inhibitor, with chemotherapy as first-line therapy of triple negative breast cancer. That's the current approved standard of care. And however, if you look in the graph on the right, we see this is uh, progression-free survival on top and overall survival at the bottom. In green is the experimental arm, so the addition of pembrolizumab pembrolizumab, and in purple is the standard therapy with chemotherapy. And you really see separation of the curves only in the patients on the graph on the left, and the curves slowly coming together, so less benefit of treatment in the curves towards the right. And what you see is this is selecting from the from a biomarker PDL1. So looking at the presence of this biomarker PDL1, if you enrich the population for the presence of this biomarker using a higher cutoff. So if you say CPS, and I'll get into what CPS is, if you use this at a greater cutoff of 10, so a highly more highly positive PDL1 tumor, you see benefit. Whereas if you look at triple negative breast cancer overall, they don't seem to benefit. So not all PDL1s are the same. So this is really, this could be the object of a talk itself, but I thought as a, a nice overview for uh, medical ground rounds, this would be a good introduction. So when you say a tumor is PDL1 positive, it's not like saying a tumor is HER2 positive in terms of the protein expression, like I said, gastric and breast cancer, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, whereas PDL1 positive, it's it's much more complicated than that. So first of all, if you say a tumor is PDL1 positive, if you look at lung cancer versus breast cancer, the definition is completely different. The assays are different. The cutoff is different. What you're measuring with the assay is different. Some assays look at 
immune cells, some look at tumor cells. And so when you say PD, a tumor is pd one positive, it really depends on the context in which you're saying that. To complicate things further and to show that it's not a perfect biomarker, the context even within breast cancer is completely different. So if you look at neoadjuvant treatment of metastatic breast, of a, if you look at neoadjuvant treatment of triple negative breast cancer, pdl one is not predictive. So if you look at the graph on top on the right, you see this is neoadjuvant treatment. So the standard therapy of triple negative breast cancer um, is today is pembrolizumab along with chemotherapy. So the same treatment as in the metastatic setting, but in this setting, PDL1 doesn't inform which patients benefit. And so everybody gets it regardless of their uh, PDL1 status. So what you see is PDL1 is prognostic. So on the right are the PDL1 negative tumors. You see they seem to do worse, like the graphs are lower in terms of PCR, which is pathological complete response. So less uh, response of the tumor to your treatment. Um, compared to the PDL1 positive tumors, but the delta between the addition of pembrolizumab to chemotherapy is roughly the same, roughly 15%. So it's prognostic. These tumors seem to respond better to chemotherapy, but it's not predictive. You, you benefit from pembrolizumab regardless of your PDL1 status in the neoadjuvant setting, even within the same tumor type. So just showing how PDL1 positive does not mean the same, uh, same thing overall. Secondly, I wanted to really show how the sample selection for PDL1 positive, I'll just show the example in breast cancer, really influences um, the rate of positivity and not so much your outcome. So if you look in the metastatic setting of triple negative breast cancer, there was a study done where they looked at one of the large cohorts treated with atezolizumab, which was a PD1, a PDL1 inhibitor that was, sorry, there's a lot of, sorry, I just got a pop-up. Um, that Sorry, the that was looking at PDL1 status in the metastatic setting of triple negative breast cancer, trying to see, well, if you're positive in a breast where, where, or if you're positive in a metastatic site, uh, do you respond the same way? And are you just as likely to be PDL1 positive if I biopsy the archival tissue, so the breast of the initial diagnosis or the metastatic site? So first off, we see that the primary tissue. So if you biopsy a breast, you have a higher rate of PDL1 positivity. So in the same patient, you're more likely to have pd one positive uh, status if you biopsy a breast or look, go, go get her archival tumor sample. Whereas if you biopsy a metastatic site, slightly less positive rates, so 36%. Also, if you look at the different metastatic sites, if you biopsy a breast versus lung versus liver, you don't have the same rate of positivity. So in a given patient, if you biopsy the liver, it's associated with much lower rates of pdl one positivity. So in the range of only 13%, whereas if you biopsy lymph node or breast, closer to 40 or 50%. And this is thought to be related to the, the fact that liver is the tumor microenvironment, the liver is less infiltrated by uh, immune cells and how you define pdl one positive is really looking at immune cells. And so in a given patient, practically speaking, this is actually a problem we face. If I have a patient with metastatic triple negative breast cancer and I only have a liver biopsy I, and it's PDL1 negative, well, I sometimes will ask for a repeat biopsy of a lymph node or a breast because if she's PDL1 positive, she's just as likely to benefit as long as one site is PDL1 positive. Anyway, in this study, we don't have many studies about this question. There seems to be a benefit as long as you have a site that's PDL1 positive. And so really understanding the limitations of which sample you're biopsying and also the context, again, is very important. And again, so there's different assays. I won't get into detail about this, but basically if you look at within the same uh, tumor group, so in the same population, this was uh, the same trial population and they tried to define uh, pd one positive using different assays to see if it identified the same patients. And in fact, it didn't. So different using different test methods, you would really find um, that, for example, the assay SP142 was a subgroup of the assay 22C3. And so depending on the assay that you use, you might not be uh, giving the right treatment to the right patient. So it's important to use the right companion diagnostic with the right uh, therapy if you're trying to reproduce the outcomes that you get in a clinical trial. So other markers that have really been uh, of interest but quite controversial are MMR and MSI status. So all these are there's 
two last treatments, two last biomarkers that I want to review. So MMR is basically a DNA repair mechanism that can be deficient. So D being deficient, MMR, which leads to MSI. MSI is basically a pattern of hypermutation. So what's called the hypermutated phenotype. So basically tumors that have a lot of mutations. Um, and traditionally, I think most people think of microsatellites or microsatellite instability. We learn about these more in the context of specific genetic syndromes, for example, Lynch syndrome, which is associated with increased risk of cancers, for example, colon cancer, endometrial cancer, and gastric cancers. Um, but um, these tumors are Okay, this Lynch syndrome is is really a defect in like a um, a germline mutation in one of the proteins of mismatch repair uh, in one of the genes associated with mismatch repair. But you can also get it sporadically. So in the context of, for example, breast cancer or lung cancer, you could get a tumor that is MSI high, so that has this hypermutated phenotype, not related to Lynch syndrome. It's usually more related to epigenetic changes, basically methylation of the promoter of the genes in question. And so given the, the MSI and uh, D and, and MMR became of clinical interest because it was thought that if you have a hypermutated phenotype, you would really, you would have more neoantigens. So you would be presenting more antigens to the immune system, and therefore you might be more likely to respond to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And so there's different ways of testing this status. It's very, it's a lot more complex than a lot of the other tests that I presented earlier. Uh, it can be done through immunohistochemistry, where you look at the protein expression of, MM, of the MMR proteins. It can be done through PCR, looking more at the microsatellite, at the microsatellite lens. And this has been, um, there's been validated ways of measuring this, like PCR um, panels that have been validated for this. You can also do it through NGS, which is more costly, obviously, and more time consuming and requires compu computational methods to really analyze your NGS results. And finally, through germline genetic testing, um, and which germline genetic testing, which are mostly done in the context of Lynch syndrome. If you look at these different tests, is that some patients might, that usually the screening tests that are done in the context of tumors that tend to have these, have these characteristics like colon cancer, IHC and PCR tends to be done. But in the context that now there's treatments that are associated with the status, this biomarker being positive, there's been interest to find ways of finding more MSI high tumors by methods that are maybe more sensitive like NGS, for example. And so again, looking at the test that was done and understanding how your, your tumor was defined as MMR or MSI high, MMRD or MSI high is really uh, important. So in the past, it used to just have clinical implications of, well, if you have Lynch syndrome, you have the higher, higher risk of colon cancer, endometrial cancer, and you should be followed more closely in terms of screening. And so, and these tumors were also found to have certain clinical scenarios. So for example, in colon cancer, they're associated with more right-sided tumors, gastric cancer, older age, female sex. Uh, but now that it is also a predictive biomarker, and I'll show you there's been work that's that's been done to show that in patient in tumors, in on the left here, this is colon cancer, colon cancer, which is associated to Lynch syndrome and higher rates of MSI high tumors or MMR deficient tumors. Um, it, they, it was found that these patients responded very well to pembrolizumab, a form of checkpoint inhibitor, as opposed to chemotherapy. But it was also found that seeing these that the status of this biomarker could be used in other tumor sites on the right. Uh, this was a, a, a clinical trial, Keynote 158, where they tried to use all, you know, site agnostic, whatever your tumor was, as long as you had this biomarker positive, you could go on to therapy with pembrolizumab. And so now it was the first, in fact, uh, biomarker uh, biomarker driven approval of an FDA drug. So saying it's tumor agnostic, it's not the tumor site that in which the, um, the drug was approved, but really more related to the biomarker positivity. And this was, um, is now an, appro an FDA approved indication in the States. So finally, TMB, see, people got all riled up seeing that um, you could really find patients that benefit from therapy using a biomarker and not a tumor site. Well, this would be really potentially interesting in patients who otherwise have tumors that don't have uh, great therapies, for example, cholangiocarcinoma or patients with pancreatic cancer that we haven't had great uh, success in terms of, of alternative therapies. It was thought, well, what if you were to find the subset of patients that have this 
status a, a biomarker associated with higher rate of response to immunotherapy, we might be able to tease out those patients who respond well. So there was a lot of interest in finding more biomarkers, one of which being TMB. And TMB is often spoke of in the context of DMMR or MSI because it's another form of showing a hypermutated phenotype. So basically a tumor that has a lot of, of uh, a high mutational burden. So what TMB is, is it's tumor mutational burden. You take a sequence of DNA and you look at how many mutations per megabase are present. There are different cutoffs that are used, but if you have a lot of mutations, you're found to have a tumor that might potentially respond to immunotherapy. So this was a biomarker of interest that was tested. And in fact, um, I just wanted to highlight MSI high doesn't really, it, it doesn't mean that you're TMB high, which is sometimes confuse one for the other, but there's nice studies that show that these are not the same population. Most MSI high tumors tend to be TMB high, if you see in the, in the graph right here, but there are TMB high tumors that are not as MSI high. So it really identifies two separate populations. And so um, this was quite controversial in the sense because the testing is quite complex, as you can imagine. You're trying to see how many mutations you have per uh, DNA sequence. And so the gold standard would be whole exome sequencing, which in most centers and most for most patients is not accessible. And, and so this was a, yes, potentially a biomarker, but one that was quite complex to test and test reliably and test in an accessible way for patients. Uh, and so there was efforts done to try to use NGS panels. So panels that we use uh, basically that look at a given number of mutations and say, well, could we not find a way of saying that the tumor is hyper, it has a higher rate of mutation using these panels that are more, less, more accessible and less complex? And so a lot of um, companies have come out with these panels. And there's been a lot of work trying to, un, you, to, to find uniformity amongst these different panels coming out, trying to test them as against the gold standard of whole exome sequencing to say, okay, well, how many genes do you have to look at? What is the cutoff that you would use to say that this tumor has a high rate of mutation per megabase? Uh, what is the sample that you should use, et cetera? And so this has been a lot of work and really is just starting to push, you know, how we define and how we repro how reproducible a, a clinically relevant biomarker should be. And, and so as a predictive biomarker, there was a paper presented in the New England that showed, well, tumors that have high rates of TMB here on the x-axis have a higher rate of objective response rate to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And so tumors that, this was ev early evidence that there it might be a predictive biomarker for, for immune checkpoint inhibitors. However, it's it's really not been such a perfect story. There was, again, a retrospective um, analysis of uh, a pre-planned retrospective analysis of uh, the Keynote 158 study, which was a multi-cohort study looking at different tumors. And so a basket study of multiple tumor sites that basically they said, well, if you have TMB high, we'll give you pembrolizumab and see if um, we'll see if the patients who had TMB high responded well to um, immune checkpoint inhibitors. And again, this was an indication that was approved by the FDA based on this TMB status. And so an improved pre companion diagnostic and a recognized predictive biomarker in this setting. The story, however, is not as simple because a lot of groups criticized this approval saying it was too broad, that really for the reasons I, exp I explained in part, you know, are we really identifying a population uh, that is TMB high that responds specifically to, um, to checkpoint inhibitors or are there confounders such as the MMR status or other status uh, or other um, phenotypes that really are hidden within the TMBs that are actually driving this seeming benefit to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And there's a group that published a paper looking at um, colon cancers here on the left, where if you separated their population using PM TMB by a recognized cutoff of 10 mutations per megabase, it seemed they, the patients that were TMB high and blue here really seemed to benefit, whereas those that were TMB low didn't seem to benefit. Whereas if then you, can, you further um, further categorize these patients by their MMR status. In fact, if you were MMR proficient, so if you had a tumor that did not have this deficiency in MMR, that was TMB high, you really didn't benefit at all. And so the, the benefit that would seem to be associated to immune checkpoint inhibitors were really driven by this MMR deficient subgroup here in, in yellow. 
And other groups have reproduced this and shown similar findings showing that really those who are TMB high that seem to benefit are really those category one, what are called category one TMB highs, that are those that are TMB high that are associated also with CD8 T cell lymphocyte infiltration. And so really just a subgroup of this TMB. So what are my take home messages? I hope I've convinced you over the last, thank you for being patient with me. I've gone over a bit over time, but I hope I've convinced you that precision medicine is really highly dependent on the use of biomarkers. And you're, it's only precision medicine if your biomarkers are just as precision, uh, are just as precise as the therapies that they're geared to, 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 to be, uh, to, to be associated with. And so if you don't have the right companion diagnostic, you might be treating the wrong population of patients and potentially uh, exposing patients to uh, toxicities that don't need to be and really losing um, precious time where they could be using an alternative treatment that would be better suited for their subgroup of cancer. Biomarkers require adequate perspective validation. So not only should they be, you, you can't just look at these retrospective cohorts. I hope the TMB story, uh, you know, as, as interesting as that biomarker is, and I think it's actually a very useful one in certain settings, I think that uh, looking at it retrospectively does open, um, open a can of worms in terms of the biases that can be inherent to this form of validation. And finally, for a given bi validated biomarker, even if your tool is great, so you have a great biomarker, it's been properly validated prospectively, you also have to think of the limitations in terms of which sample did you use? What was the timing of the sample that you used? Uh, and what is the clinical context? Should you really be doing a reflex test, testing everybody with this, or really just those that are likely to benefit and really show different in difference in outcomes? Because ultimately, that's what patients and what uh, us as physicians should be looking to improve. So that's pretty much it. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Saldera. Really fascinating and, and comprehensive lecture. Um, very, yeah, I, I agree with uh, Sasha Bernanski. Very complicated, but very well presented. So thank you so much for that. Uh, there's not much time for questions, but if you have a question, please do enter it in the chat. My question to you, uh, I do have a question for you. In terms of uh, cost and cost benefits, so, uh, you know, give us an idea. What What is the, the cost of doing biomarkers? This is, and is this something that we can re readily get here at the MUHC or is it sort of restricted? Can you walk me through that a little bit? I mean, I think that's a, an, an excellent point. I mean, I was thinking of the, uh, when I was thinking of the clinical utility, when you think of it as a, as a, as an approval, from an approval perspective, if you think of Ines or PCoder, who really has to look at the cost involved, it really depends on the test you're doing. Certain tests like immunohistochemistry or PCR can be quite cheap, and it really depends on the context that you're doing. For example, if you're doing an individual PCR for a test, um, that could otherwise be done in an NGS panel. If the NGS panel is being done for other reasons anyway, and you could integrate it in a, in a, in a panel that's otherwise already done, uh, then it might actually be cost-effective to use the NGS. So it really depends on the context, but you're absolutely right in the sense that some of these tests, you can't start doing whole exome sequencing and all your tumors in clinical practice to identify these rare cases. And so it can be cost will definitely be limiting. And I think it's also the point that I was making of the selection of the context, the cost also depends on the context. And so for a given tumor site, it might make sense to do an NGS panel, whereas in other tumor sites, it might be more, uh, it might be more uh, interesting to do a PCR where you're really just looking for that specific gene and not nothing else really, if there's no companion diagno diagnostic, uh, di no companion uh, treatment. The context, the difficulty I think that we face in oncology is this is ever changing very quickly. And so what didn't have, you know, an implication in terms of a predictive biomarker and associated drug a year ago, by the time we developed the test and really validated and use it in broad span provincial perspective, you know, a year later, well, suddenly there is a drug that is useful. And so the, con the clinical context is constantly shifting. So I think these are definitely things from a provincial perspective we have to look at um, and be really forward looking and be able to to kind of adapt over time, which I think has been uh, uh, the limitation of a lot of uh, the access to these tests and the associated drugs. Fantastic. Dr. Boganin? Yeah, maybe just to add one thing. Um, we're lucky at the MUHC that from an OptiLab, um, you know, direction, um, it looks like we are the center for uh, next generation sequencing. So in fact, we already do for 
all colorectal patients, full, uh, you know, about 70 genes for next generation sequencing. Um, we do it for all rare tumors, for any young patient that requires, uh, you know, last resort treatment. Um, for sarcoma patients in the pediatric uh, world, it's done. So we're quite advanced from a provincial perspective on the NGS. From a provincial perspective for funding, you know, tumors like lung cancer have reflex NGS that are done, given that some of the genes are just cheaper to do through NGS. So, you know, anywhere you are in the province, there will be, um, you know, an NGS done. And so if you're at St. Jerome, the sample actually is shipped to McGill to be done for NGS. Um, so this is something that's happening, you know, on an everyday basis here in the clinic, especially at the MUHC. Um, and uh, what, you know, the big question, and maybe, you know, maybe uh, Sarah can give us her uh, opinion on it is dynamic testing. So, you know, we spoke a lot about static testing at the primary tumor, the biopsy, but in the US, what they're doing right now is testing for the blood throughout the treatment. So maybe, yes. you know, you don't need to continue treatment if you don't have the biomarker anymore, maybe you should change the treatment. Yes, I actually, so initially when I, when I was preparing this talk, my goal was to talk about ctDNA, which is really an area of interest for me, but I was surprised to see the guideline panels of ASCO for metastatic breast cancer, you know, recommending against it, whereas the ESMO ones do are more um, open to it. And so ctDNA, the, the benefit of it is that, as I mentioned, you know, the timing of testing uh, is very important in the context of certain cancers. Really, if you do a mutation at progression versus a mutation at baseline, a lot of these mutations are acquired mutations. So under the stress of treatment, the tumors shift and change and acquire these characteristics. And so if you look at the initial sample, it's it's really not um, like, a, for example, an ESR1 mutation, which is a resistance mechanism to endocrine therapy. It's very rare in the initial tumor, but over time under the treatment with aromatase inhibitors, it's very it's a common mutation. And so if you're testing the wrong sample, it's really completely useless. Um, and so I think you, it's very hard, you know, if you think of the cost and the how readily patients would accept a, a biopsy, these are patients who, you know, are undergoing a lot of treatments, are quite tired, they're fed up of it being in and out of the hospital. When you offer a biopsy that is not always, you know, a, a proper sample, you know, you could do a biopsy and be non-diagnostic. You know, it's it's it really limits the access to certain drugs. Now, CTN, CTDNA has its limitations in the sense of, as you saw, there's always uh, the concordance rate with the sample. How are you doing your CTDNA? Um, what it? But I have to say, it is far more practical in common practice. And in fact, it in certain contexts, for example, pick three CA mutations. You know, we do these regularly, liquid biopsies, because you know we find at the time of progression, you're it's more interesting to do it then than go fish back the, the initial tumor. Fantastic. We're coming, actually, it is one o'clock, 101. So we're going to have to stop there, but really fascinating. I mean, this is really, I've learned a lot. And I think it's a lot of this is new uh, new data for, for many of us here in the Department of Medicine. So really, thank you for sharing this with us. Congratulations on the work you're done. And uh, very happy to see that uh, McGill is at the forefront of this. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Great presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very Nathaniel much. as well. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you for everyone's attention today. I appreciate it. Have a great afternoon. Likewise. Thanks.